Ross, North Dakota is right in the middle of the state on the northwestern quadrant of the state. It's a small community. The Arab community that came to the United States, though there are in this museum examples of the Arab community that came early, much earlier than this. In fact, uh, Brother Amir, and I want to thank him for inviting me. I was really honored to be invited. Show me when I showed me when I came here some months ago with Dr. Suleiman Yang, who was on my doctoral committee. My doctoral thesis was Christian-Muslim dialogue, the sociological dimension, not the not the not the religious dimension, but the sociological dimension, all going all the way back to the Prophet, going to Abyssinia, and then just going from that in terms of the dialogue and the interaction that's taken place. And my family comes from Lebanon, my father's family, from a small village in Lebanon, which has always been both a Christian and a Muslim village. And there's a mosque and there's a church. And when I visited the village when I was young, I was able to um, go to the mosque for the Eid, and the Muslims came to the church for Christmas. And it's always been that way for hundreds of years. Um, my family is, uh, I'm, the family is Seba, S-A-B-A, S -B -A, and Brother Amir showed me at least two places in the museum where you see that family name, Revolutionary War soldiers and Civil War soldiers that he has found records of. So I was quite pleased to see that, that my name is here. And the picture of the mosque that's, uh, the first mosque that's in, in the collection came from the foundation that I had at the Athiyah Foundation. Now, the Athiyah Foundation, Athiyah means in Arabic, is derived from gift of God, Atta. And that's the family that my, my, the main family, tribal family name, having come from South Arabia. And my father was quite a historian and tracked that family all the way back to the year 400, pre-Islamic. And um, that tribe moved north, went into the Haran of Syria, and then split. Some stayed in Syria, some went to uh, Lebanon. That's the branch my family comes from. And in Lebanon, they went to four different places. My family was, was Christian, but the Athiyas that stayed in Arabia were Muslim. And then later, a branch of my family converted to Islam in, in Lebanon. So uh, the mayor of one of the villages, Kana, in Lebanon is Ali Atiya, who's a fairly close relative of ours, whereas our family was, was Christian. So it's always been a mix. And I, I am, uh, my father, who grew up in that village, always had on the mantle of our fireplace a Quran and a Bible. And whenever I would be studying at, in my hometown, would we be learning our Sunday school lessons, he would pull the Quran. They were both in Arabic, and he would read to me the parts of the Quran about Moses and about Noah and about Jesus and Mary that came from the Quran. And I always, I, he always said, you see, it was told from two different perspectives, sometimes slightly different. But you see, it's the same story. And it teaches, in some cases, exactly the same lesson. In some cases, a bit of a different lesson. And there's, by the way, a beautiful book done by a um, scholar at Rhodes University in Memphis, Tennessee, where I lived for a number of years, John Kaltner. What Ishmael teaches Isaac is the name of the book. And that book puts together those verses and those parts of the Quran and the Bible to say what we have to learn from each other so much about the same thing. Not even about just, you know, the difference, but about the very same prophets and the very same stories that come from our scriptures that teach us lessons. So I grew up that way. I frankly didn't know because this particular community in Ross, North Dakota, my father used to take me there and I didn't know there was a difference of um, the Arabs in North Dakota as I was growing up. They all spoke Arabic. I didn't know there was a difference between the Christians and the Muslims. They were just all friends and warm to each other. And later learned even about the difference of the Christians from the Maronites to the Orthodox, and then from the Shias to the Sunnis. Didn't know any of that as I was growing up. They were just all Arabs and friendly and warm and spoke the same language and had the same traditions. And when you come as a, as a, as a Christian Arab, 
coming from the Middle East where 90% of Muslims are, of Arabs are Muslims, maybe 10% Christians overall. Uh, Christians are Muslim in culture. If they're not Muslim in religion, they're Muslim in culture. They don't eat pork. They, you know, have fasting things that are much more like the Muslim fasting. And, and it's, it's, just, it's a part of the culture rather than necessarily the religion. But then you find the commonality of the religions also with the nature of the sharing in these villages where there are both mosques and churches and have been for a long time. The people that immigrated to the Dakotas came to the Dakotas. Um, the gentleman from the Saudi television said, gee, one of my favorite movies is Fargo, which is in North Dakota. Uh, but, uh, but so how did Muslims, how did Arabs, how did Muslims get to the Dakotas? By the time they immigrated, and the largest immigration was in the late 1800s, it was the end of the Ottoman Empire. And the Turks, who were actually, if you can say colonialists are okay, they were one of the better colonial powers for many hundreds of years, until the end of the Ottoman Empire where they started making it very difficult and probably more difficult for Christians, but not exclusively, in terms of conscripting them into the army and actually doing what has some of you have referred to here, and that's the divide and conquer uh, kind of program. To separate the Arabs of Lebanon and Syria, you started playing Muslim Christian games, you know, which did not exist historically. Historically, going all the way back to the time of the prophet, the relationships were quite good and harmo relatively harmonious. But it was the European powers that, and the Turks that set up the little game of the enemy, my enemy is my friend, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, but the overwhelming majority of people that came to the Dakotas, and the reason they came to the Dakotas, it was the last of the homestead land. Here are people that were farming on one or two or five acres of land in the rocky, rocky land of the Levant, of the so-called Levant, of Lebanon and Syria and Palestine, were told that they could now have 160 acres of land free for coming there, prairie land that had never been farmed with no rocks and flat, cold, but incredible uh, growth process in the, in the spring and they could get it free by just living on it for five years. So they began to come, and they were the last of the homestead lands, the Homestead Act of the 1860s. The land further east and further west was, or particularly further east was taken up as far as we know. Now it doesn't look much like a mo classical mosque, but it was this group of uh, Syrian Muslims from the Bakab Syria of Lebanon that built this and it was, probably the first building built exclusively as a mosque. And they would go to services there. Um, I worked very hard to try to preserve this building as being of the great historical significance to this country, to the United States, the very first mosque. And unfortunately, I, I tried to get the state to preserve it because the Muslim community had dissipated. It wasn't being taken care of very well. They weren't even having services there anymore. And one of the Muslim farmers that lived next to it decided on his own, to the consternation of the rest of the Muslim community that was left, that it was an eyesore and he bulldozed it down one day. However, and again in the um, presentation I had, it, uh, there was uh, pictures of the existing, of the current mosque that was built. I think I have a... There's, in the same place that that original mosque was, they built a very small, small, more of a memorial mosque building than, than an actual mosque building, but that's much more typical of what we think of as a mosque. And that's um, the Mosque of the Prairies, and uh, it's, it's a fascinating place to go to. You drive and drive and drive, and then you see it. Um, Yeah, I guess there, there is a picture here that's coming up. That's it. Um, so that particular history and the fact that uh, Muslims ended up in the Dakotas 
is quite interesting. But you also had in the Dakotas, those most of you, and again, I, some of these pictures I have, some I don't, that didn't come through. But this is a picture of the very first Arab U.S. senators, senators of Arab heritage. Neither were Muslim, but they were both Arab. And Senator James Abourizik, the more heavy fella here, and Senator James Abdenour. Senator Abdenour is a relative of mine. One is a very, Abourizik was the most conservative Democratic senator of the last 50 years. And Abner was the most conservative Republican, liberal Democrat, conservative Republican. Their families were very close. They were godfathers. Their parents were godfathers of each of the respective gentlemen. And if you, those of you that have followed American congressional history know that James Abaduzic particularly was a great, great um, advocate for better relations with the Arab world, better relations with the Muslim world, and went way out on, on a limb to, to try to do that and took a lot of guff from Congress, as you might know. So there is this Arab and Muslim tradition in the Dakotas, which is really, really quite unique. Um, if I can get on here, that's a picture uh, that came from the film of that beautiful mosque. They've always left the Crescent Star up. That was, that was never taken down. Uh, now, the next person is Ali Hassan. Alia is, as I mentioned, she was the um, her family first came to the United States in the 1870s, the Agdi family, uh, Muslims from the Bakav of Lebanon. Alia was an early, strong, strong lady, very feminist in her approach. She was married, betrothed at a very young age. She was born in Kadoka, South Dakota, on a farm. And I, by the way, I have Amir, brother Amir, I have two tapes of her that she made. Uh, actually on CD, quite extensive, talking about those early experiences. And then more importantly, she was betrothed, she was married at 15, she went to New York, divorced, became very, very an, much of an activist in the Muslim cause in the United States. She, more than any single person probably in those early days, at least certainly more than any, any female, worked to unite universal Islam with the nation of Islam. I don't know if you have anything about her, but she's an important person, and her papers are at the University of Michigan. It should be researched much more heavily. That was very important to her. In the process, met Malcolm X, and became a strong advocate of Malcolm going to Mecca. And she was one of the leading people that helped to get Malcolm to, uh, to Mecca. Now again, this is not a story that's told very much or much is known about. It. When he died, when he was assassinated, she was one of the people that washed the body. She was a very important person in this, in this whole thing. And she uh, was very much of a non-traditionalist in so many ways. She was very proud of her, of her Muslim heritage, very proud of what she bought, and she f helped to form Access, which is the largest probably helping Arab American Muslim organization in the United States in Detroit uh, with, with quite a huge budget. She founded it, her, her uh, grandson took it over eventually, Ish Ahmad, and it's now a flourishing organization, which was the organization that formed the Arab Ameri National Arab American Museum, which I'm on the board on, uh, of, of in, in uh, Dearborn, Michigan. And it's an organization that I would like to see work being much more closely with some of you, because about half of it is, you know, composed of Arabs, you know, the, uh, the history of, of Ar Islamic Arabs, Muslim Arabs, and the other half Christian Arabs. But it's a, have any of you visited that museum? Anybody in this? Should visit it. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, it's quite nice. And she, as I say, this woman is, it was just incredible what she did. She, um, I think I have another picture here someplace of her. Yeah, that's her. This was when she formed um, Access in, uh, I think, the 1970s. And some of the people that she formed Access with. But she, as you can see, she, she was born in 1910, but she 
was quite modern in her outlook and what she did. She did some tremendous things originally from South Dakota and from a family that's still in South Dakota. That's uh, part of, and it's so interesting to talk to the very few people that are left from the early days of the Muslim school. The Imam used to come uh, perform the marriages. They had an Imam there way back when. And um, the tradition that is lost to a lot of South Dakotans, that's another important part, I think, of our work we do. We have to bring those stories back to our own folk. Who, who have missed this part of history in many ways. Uh, and or, you know, there have been so many conversions. One of the funny things is there the, a lot of the families converted to Christianity in the Dakotas because there were so few left and they, they, they just didn't have the resources to have their own <coughs> services, their own imam, et cetera. So um, there's a family called the Muhammad family from South Dakota that converted to Christianity, but they kept the name Muhammad. And there's one young lady that I know whose name is Christy Muhammad. She's blonde and blue-eyed and Christian, and she's not married. So I can imagine, she's told me every time she gets on an airplane, here's this blonde, blue-eyed woman with the last name Muhammad, and the first question is, you're married to somebody named Muhammad? No, I'm single. So, ma'am, would you mind standing over here? Of course, we, we don't have racial profiling and, or ethnic profiling in this country, do we? Well, ask Christy Mohammed sometime. So you have things like that. Also, I don't know if many of you remember, I, I, the stories that come out about, you know, every time there's a killing in a mall or a school, immediately, of course, all of us of Arab and Muslim heritage right away say, oh, please let it not be an Arab or Muslim. But the media right away say this had to be an Arab and Muslim. It's, you know, you, you can tell by the murder, by the killing, and then they find out it isn't, they don't apologize, okay? So if you remember, I think it was in Kansas, maybe Missouri, about five years ago, where a man who was a Christian came in and started shooting up a church. He was Christian, and he was one of these anti-abortioners or, what, you know, had some bones to pick. Immediately, they thought it was a Muslim shooting up a church. It was a Christian, and he was doing it based on his Christian values. And he was shot and killed by a woman named Asim. Okay? Now, that Asim was from the South Dakota Asim family, who are Muslims. Now, not one news story carried the fact that a Muslim ended up killing a guy who was killing Christians, who was advocating it based on his Christian value. And one of the words that to me is the worst word, and any time a Muslim uses it, I particularly think it's sinful, and that's the word Islamist. You know, every time I see the word Islamist, and I'm telling you, a lot of Muslims use that word, I, I, just, I just shrink, because you don't, the guy that says, well, I'm gonna go kill this doctor, because I'm a Christian and he's performing abortions, so I'm doing it based on my Christian values. He's not called a Christianist ever is he nor is a jew who blows up a like what has happened in israel blows up a mosque and starts shooting people he's not called a judaist so why are those few muslims that are not representative of islam that kill people mercilessly why are they called islamists because somebody else is defining this for us and whoever defines the situation controls it never forget that Whoever defines the situation controls it. Don't let them define it. And that's what's happening here in this museum. You're helping to redefine at, or put it back to its original definition rather than letting other people define these things for you. It's very important. So here we have Ali Hassan and the relationship she had to Malcolm X and the important thing that came right from the Dakotas. See if I can go on here without making any more, seeing any more. That's the Malcolm X part. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about a third component that's pretty fascinating. And that's Muslims and Indians in the Dakotas. Okay, this is Joe Albert. 
Joel was, uh, his name was uh, uh, actually not really Joel Albert. It was uh, Yusuf Ahmed, I think. And Joel was, uh, I ran for the United States Senate in North Dakota in 1980. And as I went around the states, talking to the old farmers, they said, Yo, you're Syrian, right? Were you related to Joe Albert, the beer, the bear wrestler? This guy was a real character, part of the original Muslim community that came to the United States. This is his American Indian wife, okay? Uh, the Christians that came to the United States and came to the Dakotas, particularly at that, in that era, were, um, you know, m many of them, their, their women came with them. So most of them married other, other Arab women that were Christian. The Muslims, very few of them brought women. And because they were a little different, a little more swarthy, didn't seem to have the same religion, ended up many of them marrying Native Americans. This was, Joe had, I think, four wives in the course of his life. Had one of his, one of his, his youngest son, and he had been dead. Joe died in 1954 with, a, sorry to say, a bottle of Arak in his, in his hand. Um, but he, uh, he was a guy that would go around the state with a bear and he would wrestle that bear for money. People would say, who are you gonna put your money on? And they'd generally put the money on the bear and he'd beat the bear up. He also would sit on the ground and he was a little bitty guy, he's about 5'4", 5 5'3", 5 5 a little bitty guy, slender, relatively slender. He'd sit on the ground, he'd say to the big Swedes and Norwegians, anybody that can pick me up by my ears I'll give 50 bucks, but if you can't pick me up by my ears, I want the 50 bucks. Nobody ever was able to pick him up. He could just plant himself. And people, when I was running for the Senate, would say to me, you related to that guy? I mean, he's, you know, fantastic guy, really interesting guy. But um, he, uh, his youngest son, I, I met and said, now, you're the youngest son. I mean, he had like something like 18 kids from four wives. They said, um, what, uh, you know, how old was your dad when you were born? He says, oh, you mean the old man? Yeah. Let's see. He was 80. So he was a very virile guy, character that everybody loved. My dad, I actually met him when I was a little kid. I kind of have this vision of remembering this guy with a bear, and it was just the craziest thing. But um, a really important part of the Dakota history. In any case, many of the... Uh, descendants of the uh, the Arab um, Muslims that that uh, settled North Dakota. Okay, well uh, this this will give you a little bit of idea of where they came from. In, um, this is this is Lebanon, Beirut, Damascus here. And this area is where the majority of them came from. Um, my father's village is Ain Arab. Ain Arab was half Christian and half Muslim. Most of the rest of the villages here in this area are most, you know, mostly Muslim. But this little area is where most of these Dakota folks came from. Um, now, where did they settle? Oh, and they brought their pictures. This is great. This is a, f I'll show you later who, the person that I think is the first Muslim legislator in the United States. And I asked Brother Amir if he could verify that. Um, you told me that somebody from North Dakota, or from North Carolina, probably the mid-70s. This, the, this, this is the grandfather of a, of a guy who is from North Dakota that was a state legislator in the late 60s and early 70s. And I'll show you a picture. But they brought their pictures of their people along, which really, you know, was kind of strange for North Dakota. North Dakota is primarily Northern European. 95% um, of the people, it's not a very diverse state in terms of ethnicities. 95% of the people are either of Norwegian or German background. So they have a lot in common, their languages aren't that different, not that different from English. And along comes the Arabs, and particularly the Arab Muslims, which, which, who brought in a culture very, very different, except they were the link between these groups, in other words, the Germans didn't talk with the Norwegians, the Irish didn't talk with the Germans, but the Arabs were peddlers. This particular book that I told you about is just an incredible book, and it's titled 
Syrian Lebanese in North Dakota, prairie peddlers, because they discovered very early, and uh, those of you that have seen the movie Oklahoma, the character that Eddie Elbert plays, the, the merchant that goes around, they actually make him a Persian. I don't know why they didn't make him an Arab. There were very few Persians, but it was pretty much Arabs that were the peddlers, including the Arab women who used to ford rivers and all kinds of things when they, they found out, well, we, they can make money just as much as the men can, so let's let them go out and peddle to the women. And um, that peddling tradition really didn't exist where they came from. They were farmers, most of them, and simple people, but they many, many, a high percentage became peddlers for a couple of reasons. One, they, they were honest, they were very honest, and, and the people liked their honesty. They didn't cheat people, number one. They sold things, things from the Holy Land, things from the Middle East, and carried messages around from village to village. This is before there were telephones and radios and all that stuff, and they just carried the stories of what was going on. In the Plus, they didn't need to know much English. They could, you know, hum, you know, this kind of stuff. And they, instead of the tradition that the Europeans came from, where they worked as laborers and worked to get a monthly salary and they were paid at the end of the month. The Arabs and the Muslims started, you know, they could go out and they could sell something today and have the money in their pocket. They liked that. They did very well. Um, they, uh, they, uh, many, most of them then with the advent of the automobile, they, um, they made their living by farming early, and very few of them are farmers, except today, except interestingly, here's where the Muslim community settled the most, this part of North Dakota, okay? Which was the worst farming land in the, in the country that was left. And they were dirt farmers, and not many of them became peddlers, although part-time they did. So I remember traveling up here. I grew up in Bismarck, and my father used to take me up to see people up there and you'd go along the road and you'd see mailboxes that would say Ole Olson, Hans Schmidt, and Hassan Abdullah, which seemed a little out of context, but my dad knew all these guys, he'd introduce me. Well, Hassan Abdullah today and Shahate Juma, their grandchildren are on land. How many of you have heard of the Bakken oil field? The Bakken. Okay, Bakken oil field is the oil field discovered in North Dakota. Not so long ago. There's always been oil in North Dakota, but they discovered much more oil. That state right now with 600 people, 600,000 people population is now producing 1 million barrels of oil a day. Now that's the leading, that's about to pass Texas as the leading producer in the United States. Um, there's an Indian reservation right here with some mixed Arab Indians called, uh, called uh, Fort Berthold, their income is $40 million a month, tribal income. Not from gambling, like many of the tribes have done, but from oil income. These guys here who kept their land, and many of them did, the poor Muslim farmers, are now multimillionaires. Okay? Very interesting the way history creates this and changes this. Um, and, uh, but most North Dakotans don't like the wealth, believe it or not. Wall Street Journal just did an article because they found there are now more millionaires per capita in, in North Dakota probably than any place per capita because these people all have been making so much oil money and there's so few of them. And the guy interviewed the head of the Chamber of Commerce up here in Williston, which is the main big city, a bigger city. He said, I bet you see a lot of Rolls Royces and Bentleys, right? The guy said, nah, occasionally they'll buy a F-150 truck, Ford truck. They just don't show off. But, and they don't like, I mean, they, nobody dislikes wealth, but they don't like what the wealth has brought in. Sort of gold rush kind of craziness and a lot more crime and, you know, immoral things that are happening with, with that. Unfortunately, that happens. But it's nice to see that these poor dirt farmers now have gotten so rich. And I mean, some of their great grandchildren of the people that I talked about are getting checks for $15,000 a month, oil royalty checks. So it's kind of interesting and fascinating that that's, that's happened. So the Indian-Arab connection, 
The Turtle Mountain Reservation that I told you about is right up here. It's the largest population one. And I believe three of the last five tribal council chairmen are mixed Arab Muslim Indian heritage. And they still have Korans from, their, from what their family brought. And they still have some of the tradition. So as you looked at them, I think one of the brothers here was is part Cherokee, I believe he was saying. But I mean, as you look at them, you would not know they have anything other than Native American blood. I took some Native Americans to Alaska to meet Alaskan Native Americans and from the tribal council from a reservation that's, well, it's down here. And, um, you know, their name were like Yellow Hawk and uh, Kills the Road. And then one of the guy's names, and he looked just like everybody else, was Abdush. And I said, oh, wait a minute, that's, are you, you know, all Indian voices? I'm all Indians, but my grandfather came from, come from uh, Syria and he was Muslim. So you find this, and again, these are all lost or very poorly known components of American history that I think need to be researched, cataloged, dealt with in much more depth. And that's why, as I say, I've been so happy that to get to know Brother Amir and, yes, sir. Okay. I just want to just show you one, la one last thing and then I'll go back. I can go back. This is Gene Nicholas. He's actually from the Asi family. He was a North Dakota state legislator. That picture of the gentleman with the sword was his grandfather in Syria. And he was uh, a state legislature, I think, in the late 60s through the early 70s. I mean, he's still, he's still around, but he was a, maybe the very first Muslim legislator in the United States from good old North Dakota. So coconuts in um, the Antarctic are Muslims in the Dakotas. That's the name of the game. Okay, you want me to go back to the, which slide here? This one? Okay. Oh yeah. Yes, that would, that would be in South Dakota, it's the Black Hills. It's where Mount Rushmore is. It was and still is very sacred land. Now the US government has actually offered a settlement with the Dakota Indians, which is the tribe that are mainly, it, almost all the Native Americans in South Dakota are Dakota. What we call Sioux, but Sioux means enemy in their own language, or in French. So it's, it's not, not a favorable term. Um, here there are two reservations, three actually, that are native, that are Dakota. But this one's Ojibwa and this one's Mandan, Hadatsa, and Arikara. And they, most of the land, other than the Black Hills in South Dakota, was not their original land. They were pushed off into that land. They lost their original lands. And the treaties that were developed with the Native Americans you know, were said that they would have their lands in perpetuity and they would have their health care taken care of in perpetuity. And you have people in these states that are running the state saying, oh, they, these darn Indians think they deserve a check every month and they, they're lazy. And I mean, all this racist, terrible stuff that, you know, you hear and it's, and it's, they've taken, we've taken their land away from them. This is, and they didn't put the same kind of boundaries on their land that the white people did, you know? They, the land was for mankind. It wasn't for put your fence up here and you can't, somebody else can't go on. It was for everybody. Yeah, it's pretty sad. Well, I, uh, that's pretty much my presentation, but I'll certainly answer any questions or respond to any, any thoughts that all of you have. But again, I uh, greatly appreciative of, uh, of the invitation, of the chance. And Dr. Nyang, uh, who I've known for 35 years, and I was fortunate enough to have him on my doctoral committee when I did the Christian-Muslim dialogue thing. And what a wonderful, wonderful human being that has taught so many people so much, including me. Yeah, you had a question back there. In the back.
We know so little. I mean, so I, th this book is wonderful, and there's just just great stuff in this book. There's a whole section on the Muslims, you know, the Muslim immigrants. But generally speaking, we know so little. There's so much more research to do. It's just such an ignored part of history, and I hope that some of our younger researchers will go and pursue this because it's really critical. I might say also, um, how many of you know the name Arabelle Thompson? Arabelle Thompson is in the North Dakota Hall of Fame. She was the first editor of Ebony Magazine. Um, and uh, it's really something to see with all these white faces, this one black face and the, and the North Dakota Hall of Fame. And I had, again, the, the good fortune of, of meeting her in her later years. And she told me an incredible story that I'll never forget. Um, my grandfather had a little restaurant grocery store in Bismarck, North Dakota in the early 1900s. Arabelle's father immigrated to North Dakota. Num number of black folk from the South immigrated to the Dakotas and homesteaded. You know, they actually had the same access to homesteading land as anybody did, and they got 160 acres free. And her father had homesteaded. I think he came from Kansas. And he may have been one of the Buffalo soldiers from that era because there were quite a number also, not a huge number, but there were a number of Buffalo soldiers that settled in North Dakota. So it's an interesting African-American history. And I haven't really found a tie between that African-American history and the, and the Muslim history in, North, in the Dakotas, but there probably are things that one would find if they really do some deep research. Um, uh, and by the way, the Buffalo soldiers in the black community in, in the Dakotas chose kind of to do business if possible, as did the Indians and people like the gypsies with the with the Arab traders because they could identify with them a lot more they were by the way I'm I, they always tease me because they they kicked me out of the Arab things I was the first executive director of the National Association of Arab Americans I always say I'm the white sheep of the family rather than the black sheep of the family okay because a lot most of the people in my family are quite dark but the um, the Arab American uh, or the, or the community in, in the Dakotas, in, in North and South Dakota, that exists today, having evolved from that, you know, are, are trying to put this all back together, trying to put this history together. And you're not, we're not getting a lot of cooperation, although there are really good historians that, that want to put it together. And um, most of the old timers, you know, the original immigrants, obviously now, even their children are dead. So it's hard to put this history together. I mean, I do. We do have a few things like Alia's, you know, uh, recordings that should, you should have copies of, etc. And again, I, you've heard me kind of talk about asking questions about inclusiveness. You know, I, I don't want to say I, I'm not advocating this inclusiveness to the dilution of anything that you're doing with the emphasis on the African-American component of, of Islam in the United States. That's really important for a lot of reasons. But to, to not exclude the non-Arab American Muslims that are early pioneers, that have, give, you know, have contributions, and the tie-ins that, that exist and that might exist in a lot more depth than we know, because nobody cared about that history. You know, and, and you know, people say, well, you know, you're Lebanese, and oh, uh, Khalil Gibran is Lebanese, and famous guy. Very few of the immigrants from these countries were the educated ones. They were the, the dirt farmers, the faladin. You know, the, the, the people that just didn't have a lot of education. Most of their children and grandchildren became very well educated and did exceptionally well. And by the way, the interesting tie-in with the Muslims and the traditions of the Dakotas are what was happening in America at the time. There's some interesting stuff. The commonalities are the things that made them fit in more than even some of the others. For example, a large part of the immigrants in that early part of the immigration were here when probation was on. And they didn't have, pro you know, generally speaking, didn't have any any problem with prohibition because of the prohibition of, of um, you know, that existed in Islam, things like that. So there were, and the family, extended family traditions, the honesty that existed. Am I saying other people were dishonest? No. But my, my father, and I mentioned this yesterday, I think it was, at the, at the, at the seminar. My father said, you know, frankly, he said, I, I happen to be Christian, but I would rather do business with Muslims than Christians. 
they're much more honest. I can almost be positive that they're going to be honest. Does that mean that the Christians are dishonest? No, not necessarily, but he just chose that because he knew if he did business when he was, he was a peddler with, them, with his Muslim brothers and sisters, he could feel a kind of honesty and not, not have to worry about it, anything being did. He was, he was close to getting beat up. It was close to getting beat up. And uh, he was kind of ostracized for the community for a long time. But he was one of the community, ultimately. And you know how when you have one of your own... He was a Muslim, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't you know, an anti-Muslim thing. He's just a very headstrong guy. I've met him who just decided one day he was going to bulldoze his place down. And even before that, the picture I have is one of the pictures I originally got from the state. I pleaded with him. I said, this is the first masjid in America, in North America probably. And please do something to at least preserve it as a historical place. If it's not, if there isn't a big enough community to support it as, as a masjid per se, do something to preserve it for historical purposes because it's really significant. But the, no, it's common land. Yeah, there's a cemetery there, and the cemetery is still there. You saw the, the fence post. That that cemetery is still there, um, and and so it was always, you know, common land given originally by one of the Muslim uh, Syrian Muslim uh, farmers that had land in in that area. And um, the videos are really quite interesting as people travel across the prairies and, you know, go to where the original mosque was and see the, the one that's been put up now. Sure. Not a lot. There are a few, and as I say, the ones that stayed, <laughs> you know, they have all this oil land, and they're very wealthy, and they were never wealthy, as you know, either from when they first came, or as farmers, because they just barely could. It was very dry, not re not very good land, kind of like the land that they put the Indians on. Yes, another question here. Fort Berthold. Berthold, B-E-R-T-H-O-L-D. Fort Berthold. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, this is really strange because in South Dakota and North Dakota, they're very red states. Okay? And for example, in, North, in South Dakota, where I live, the state Senate has 35 members. 32 are Republicans. Only three are Democrats. In North Dakota, it's about the same. And always been very conservative politically, et cetera, on the surface. You know? But... North Dakota has a state bank that is 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 state owned. It has a state mill and elevator that, that you know mills grain, makes bread. Has a state cement plant. The socialists from other parts of the country used to come over and from other parts of the world used to come and study the socialistic aspects of the Dakotas. It was really crazy to see such a conservative thing on the surface. The nonpartisan league stopped there with La Follette, you know fairly famous socialist leaders in the United States. And yet you have this, the, the only real political battles, by the way, are in the primaries now because the Tea Party folk, you know, run against the more center of the road Republicans. But but that's the, that's the big election. The general election is just automatically, you know, Republicans in most cases. So it's, it's, it's quite an anomaly. And yeah, and even Abarisk, Abarisk the, most liberal senator, he was voted the most liberal senator in the last 50 years, I believe, 
more liberal than McGovern, who was also a South Dakotan. Um, his family are very conservative Republicans. They wouldn't even put a McGovern sign up on their, uh, in their land when McGovern ran. They'd only put up Arborisk signs. So it's quite interesting to see that. And again, it's that farmer, even, even though guys with oil now are very conservative, because in the same way that maybe you have a good crop this year, you get a good price for your wheat, in the next five years you got a drought, you're going to lose. So that conservative attitude comes from that a lot. And it's like, okay, now we're, now we're the leading producer of oil with fracking, this new process, you know, and we're going to buy an F-150 Ford truck rather than a Bentley or a Rolls-Royce. <laughs>